Welcome to RoofCon. Uh, my name is Travis. Uh, I am the CEO and president of, uh, of Roofal. And uh, before we get going, I want to talk a little bit about kind of like my background, because I feel like my background is a little bit different than what most people in, the, in this industry go through. So for myself, I started, uh, I went to college for construction management. I came out of school in 2009. If everybody knows what 2009 was like, was a recession, right? There was a big recession going on. There was not much construction going on. So I went into interview for some jobs and I ended up landing a, a position as a canvasser, you know, door to door, you know, door knocking, you know, uh, I, I set appointments and I actually went door to door, set appointments. Uh, from there, I then moved up uh, to a sales position, in-home sales position. Um, and then kind of worked my way up through the ranks from sales management and then I kind of went over to the what they call the dark side sometimes uh, Which would be pr the, the production side of things uh, Thinking that that was better off, you know to go to the production side of things, but tried that you know production management and then got up into general management um, and then um, kind of fr from there uh, uh, went into kind of a regional management and then over uh, and I worked for a company called Hoffmover Construction and what they did was is they actually had great processes and they had great things in place uh, so that they had they were able to uh, advance their employees they had room for growth within their employees so you could actually move up so I feel like it's kind of a rare a rare upbringing in this industry because most people like to jump around. Everyone wants to go to a new, you know, company. The grass is always greener over here. They're going to pay more. They're going to do all these other things. But you know, I feel like for me to be able to stay with, you know, one company the entire time, I think it's kind of a different, you know, a kind of a different background, you know, within um, within this um, within this industry. So um, it, it was about two years ago that uh, from Hoffmanberg Construction, there was five of us on the leadership team. We sat down and we said, okay, you know, what's the newest thing to come to this industry? Um, and we kind of sat down and we kind of went through as far as, well, what about, you know, e-commerce in the roofing space? So that's what I'm here to talk about today is uh, e-commerce in the roofing space. Um, so at that point, I had a, an opportunity to be able to go and work for Roofal. Is anyone in this room here heard of Roofal before? Has anyone here heard of it? Know anything about it? We'll get into it a little, little bit later and talk a little bit about it. But I was able to go over there and um, be able to work with Rufal, which is uh, e-commerce. Um, so, uh, but, but before you know, we start talking about those, I actually want to go back in time a little bit uh, and talk about kind of the evolution of actually roofing itself. So, the roofing evolution. So, the old way, everything started on paper, right? So, everyone probably remembers having paper files, right? We put everything into a file. I'm sure in your office you had those little, you know, those little plastic, you know, things on the wall where you actually kind of slid thing from side to side or the next in the next slot uh, to CRMs. So I'm sure everyone in here probably has some sort of CRM that they use now, where they actually take all their files, they scan them, they upload them, maybe even uh, contracts that they, you know, uh, e you know, e-sign within their CRMs. Uh, hand measurements. I'm sure everyone probably remembers getting up on that roof. You know, you get up there, you spend 20, 30 minutes, you know, get your tape measure out and, you know, you, you actually draw it out. I had the little bubble paper on my clipboard where I was actually drawing everything out. And then, you know, you, you'd have to actually hand measure all your roofs to you know aerial measurements. Right? Everyone knows of, you know, Eagle View and all the other aerial measurements that are out there and available um, where you can now get measurements, what, in 5, 10, 15 minutes? You can have all the measurements now. Um, calculated uh, estimates manually. So we would take our measurements. We probably would take like our price list maybe or our labor list or material list. We'd have all these things laid out and we would say, okay, let's take this and we'll do this and we add this and now all of a sudden we have our measurement, which took you, what, 30 minutes, maybe even to an hour to actually manually hand calculate, you know, all of your estimates to advanced quoting tools. I know we have ones out there, I think like Sumo Quote, Leap, and other ones that are out there to where you take a measurement, you plug it in, and it automatically populates all of your quotes for you, like instantly. Um, flipbook pre presentations. So I'm sure everyone remembers going into the house. You would sit down at the table. You'd have your little flipbook, or even like uh, I think maybe you call it even a pitch book. You're showing the customers photos of your work and things like that uh, to iPad uh, presentations. Um, so now you probably sit down at the table and you probably go through videos or different things like that to where the c customer is actually watching, you know, you do your work or you actually build a roof. Uh, product sample boards. You know, remember we used to take the sample boards, right? We'd haul them into the house, you know, like this. And the customer would say, hey, hold that up to the house. You'd hold the uh, sample board up to the house and say, what, how does this look to, you know, three-day home visualizers. There's a lot of different visualizers out there. I know Hover is probably the most popular one that's out there, but now the consumer can actually see the product on their house rather than you just trying to hold up a sample board, you know, to their home. Uh, sending orders by fax or email. 
Um, so, you know, we used to write out, you know, all the orders or we would, you know, you would scan them or even fax them to them to where now we have, you know, ordering platforms like, um, you know, I know Beacon has one, was it Beacon Pro Plus, SRS, I think they all have their own platforms now to where you can actually order all your materials through their own digital platforms. Um, door knocking. So it's kind of funny because, you know, I talk about, you know, coming to this conference, all the different conferences, and it's, you know, you look back, what, five, ten years ago, and everyone pretty much knocked doors. Everyone went out there and said, hey, what's the algorithm for getting, you know, business? And you'd say, hey, the algorithm is this. You hit a hundred doors, you're probably going to get a, get, a, get a job out of it. So a lot of the marketing was all just door knocking to where now you have, you know, S SEM, SEO, you know, di digital ad, you know, agencies. So there's so many things out there now to where it's a total different way to be able to drive business, you know, business to, to your business other than just knocking doors. Uh, physical inspections. So we used to get up there, get our chalk out, you know, we do a video, show the customer, you know, what the damage is as far as the inspection that you did to now drones, AI damage detection. I'm sure everyone has seen the drones that they have now to where the, the, the drones can actually be flown. Insurance companies are using them to where they fly them over the house. They're able to pick up damage, you know, what's mechanical damage, what's, you know, actual hail damage, you know, things like that to the in-person or in-home appointments. Uh, we would go into the house and, you know, sit down, meet with the customer for, you know, two or three hours, you know, face to face. And who here during COVID started doing virtual meetings? I think there's a lot of meetings here, you know, not during COVID that they took those in-home appointments to like Zooms and you actually met with the customer, you know, over Zoom. And the last one, which is why I'm here today and what I'm here to talk about is the in-person sale. And that's what, what I'm here to talk about as far as, you know, e-commerce. Um, so selling roofs online is what we're talking about. So, uh, we started about two and a half years ago um, is when we started selling roofs online. So Roof was a company that where we built the technology to where we actually were able to sell roofs 100% online to the customer. So we built all the pieces, put them together, and we sold roofs all over the country um, without any offices, without any people on the ground, without any presence, without any reviews, nothing like that. And all it took was is having the technology on a website that the consumer could go there 24 hours a day and be able to go there and actually buy, you know, their roofs online. I'd say about 70% of our business came in between nine and midnight, which told us a lot about, you know, the, the consumer as far as when they're actually available to actually do their shopping. Um, so why sell roofs online? Uh, easy to expand your service areas. So I'm sure everyone here, whenever they get a lead that comes in, so they get a lead, it may be 60 miles away, an hour away, um, or even further than that, you know? So if you have, you know, one, one that comes in, maybe you can, you know, reach further because you know that this customer is actually interested rather than just taking a gamble of sending somebody out there to the house. So you're able to expand your reach or expand your areas as far as where you can actually service because if you sell a roof online and you know, maybe only have to make one trip out there or two, maybe you're more likely to actually take that position rather than sending somebody out there five or six times. Uh, simplifies the sales process. So if you're selling roofs online, a job comes in, maybe you're skipping the sales rep. Maybe you're, you're, you're giving it to somebody that is a, you know, in, in, in-house, you know, sales rep, or maybe it's going directly to production. Um, it's going to simplify, simplify your, your sales process because it's going to touch less hands. We all know when sales reps get involved, sometimes things just get a little complicated. Um, saves time and money. Um, I mean, that, that's kind of the easy one right now because we're talking about gas. You know, we're talking about, you know, being able to run appointments, especially when you look at it like Florida. Uh, is anyone here from Florida or works in, works in, works in Florida as far as for Ian? Um, so when customers want estimates and there's hundreds of people calling you a day to get estimates, well, if you're able to send them to your website where they can go there and get their quotes rather than having to send sales reps out because they only have a limited amount of time, we're going to be a lot more efficient that way. As far as just sending them to the site, they get the information that they need and not having to send somebody out. So saving saves time and money, 24 hour sales potential. So like I talked about, a lot of our sales came in between, you know, the nine and midnight, which was the later hours as far as when both homeowners or say both, you know, the husband and wife or whoever was actually available because most people work now two jobs, you know, back in the eighties or seventies, most at times there's one person that works. Now there's two people that work, so they have, they just have less time available to be able to shop together and then keeping relevant against uh, amongst the giants. Um, if you don't think that other companies, if other big businesses are doing something like this, you're wrong. Anybody here here of Angie? Home advisor, Angie, whatever it may be. A-N-G-I roofing, you know, Angie roofing. Um, they're, they're doing this right now today. 
And there's other people out there, there's other companies out there that are looking to go out there and dra- grab the, the homeowner sale directly. So we need to look at it as contractors that we really need to take a, a big look as far as you know selling roofs online so we can fight back a- amongst the companies like Angie. Um, so I'm gonna talk about now as far as you know how are we gonna get there and what are you gonna do within your business to be able to you know get to the point to where you can actually sell roofs online. So the first one is don't be afraid to show your price. As we become more transparent, we gain we gain the trust back. So if pretty much every other business out there or any other uh, uh, any any other place that you go to, somebody can find a price about what it's gonna cost. This is pretty much the only industry to where you can't go online and try to figure out what this is going to cost to get your roof replaced. And I think one of the biggest things is is that you have to be able to, as a company, know what your numbers are. So you have to have a base number and everybody in your organization has to know what that base number is. Let me give you an example. If you as a company send a rep out, and actually someone just came to me the other day and talked to me about this, but if you send a rep out to a house, and I'm talking the same house, the same homeowners, the same shingles, if you send three reps out to that house, what are the odds right now that that, that homeowner is going to get three different prices? 100%, right? 100%. It's, it's because a lot of companies, they, they with their sales rep, they, they don't have their base numbers um, you know, communicated th- throughout. And it's okay if, if the numbers, you know, vary a little bit because maybe there's upgrades or things like that that they sell. But for the most part, if they go out there and they ask for the same things, they should get the same price. And so that's one of the biggest things we have to do as a company is be able to know what our numbers are. And we have to be able to communicate that with our reps because if you're going to show a price to a consumer online that they see, when you go to the house, yes, they're definitely, definitely going to hold you accountable as far as knowing what those numbers are. So this is the biggest piece um, that we have to start with as far as knowing what our numbers are. So we have to know, you know, what our, our labor, our material is, what our margins need to be, all those things like that. So that when we do show our price online, then, you know, we can, we can, when we go out to the house, then everyone knows and everyone's on the same page as far as what the numbers are. So that is, that is one of the, the, the biggest ones. Customer experience is the next one. So when you're selling online, the customer, it, it, you, don't ha- you don't have the ability to have somebody in the house um, to be able to tell them about what their customer experience is going to be and what they're actually going to experience uh, when they go through the roof replacement process. Um, so now you have to be able to show it online. So you have to be able to show it on your website as far as when you buy from us, here's what you can expect or here's what the, the process is. And it doesn't matter if it's a 10-step process. It doesn't matter if whatever it may be, you have to be able to just show them what that they're going to expect when they do buy from you because you don't have somebody in the house explaining them to what's going to happen. And you know, and that, that could be anything from a 10-point you know, inspection, you know, inspecting the attic or whatever it's going to be. You have to show them as far as what to expect. Uh, whenever they do buy from you from start to finish. You buy now, here's the next 10 steps as far as what it's going to be. Um, so for example, so we have two different companies up here, Amazon and Best Buy. Why is somebody going to choose one company over the other? We have the same product, we have the same price, everything is exactly the same. Now the consumer is going to make a choice between the two based on some reason, whether that's because they like to buy from Amazon, because they know if they buy from Amazon, they know it's going to come in two days, they probably know exactly when their Amazon truck is going to show up, uh, and they probably get excited when they when they, the Amazon guy comes because they know they're bringing some sort of package. So people are going to choose Amazon for a reason over Best Buy, or maybe somebody else chooses Best Buy because um, maybe their uncle aunt works there or whatever it may be. Um, but when when you're talking about customer experience, um, I think the biggest thing that, that you have to look at as far as it, it, is being able to differentiate yourself from other companies. Because if other companies are doing e-commerce and they're doing the same thing, you have to be able to show them why whenever they hire you, it's gonna be different than whenever they hire somebody else or what they should expect through that hiring process. For example, who's, who here has been to Disney? Hands, Disney. How many times have you been? Once, twice, five, five in the back over there. Why do you keep going back, right? It, it, <laughs> yeah, there's always a guy in the room, there's always. Um, but Disney is customer 
obsessed. And it, you know, when you go back to Disney, you know what you're going to get, right? And that's why everyone keeps going back. So they know about the customer experience and they know that if you only go once, they're probably going to go out of business. They have to keep you coming back time and time and time again. Um, so everyone knows when they go to Disney, they book a package to Disney. They're going to say, okay, I know what I'm going to get when I go to Disney. So it's a safe bet because you know what that customer experience is going to be like. Um, but a wise man once said, brands are the solution, not, not the problem. Brands are how you sort out the cesspool. And what is he talking about? He's talking about the power of because. What is your brand? What is your brand's unique value? You have to be able to show what your brand represents. So when somebody sees your brand and they see your logo, they have to know what your brand represents. So for example, um, Coors Light. I think Coors Light did a, did a really good job on this. And uh, does anybody know what what you think? What do you think of when I say Coors Light? Okay. Right. So when Coors Light came out, they they did this this big what marketing campaign or whatever. They set out their goal was is that they understand they wanted to have the coldest beer like that. That's what they want to be known for is having the coldest beer. Well, how do we know that when their beer is cold or how their beer is the coldest? Right, the mountains turn blue. Right, everyone everyone knows as far as you know. Why, why are they cold, why are the, why they are the coldest beer? But, um, what is your brand's unique value? You have to be able to show it your brand's unique value. So when customers do see your brand, you know they represent. And that's anything from, it doesn't matter if you're the, you know, if, if you're the, um, you know, Jaguars, you know, um, you know, official, you know, roofing co contractor or whatever it may be that you have, you have to be able to, to utilize, you know, your brand and what its unique value is when people see your unique value. So how will we get there? We got these four things. We talked about knowing your numbers, customer experience, br uh, unique brand, and the last one is, is we had to have a slide on it, it was processes. Because when you do sell online, there is gonna be a process involved and you have to be able to get their processes together so when the, the lead comes in or the contact comes in or the contract comes in, what is that gonna look like? You know, what is that, how is that gonna look within your business? And I'm not up here telling you guys that this is going to be the only way. Uh, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm not up here saying that everyone is going to, you know, go and buy online. I'm not saying that it is coming. It is going to be a piece of what is to come in, in the roofing industry. Um, so I think that we need to start thinking about it, you know, a, as a group and as a whole. And, and, uh, once we get all of these four things together, we can do what they're, they're doing here in this next video. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? 
leadership is over-glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. What was the video about? Doing lots of drugs. Doing lots of drugs. <laughs> I've done this a lot of times, and that's actually the first time I've heard somebody say that. <laughs> Too much Coors Light. Too many Coors Lights. Yes. Um, yes. So it was about starting a movement. Is is what it's all about. I know it was it was the lone nut, or he was the first guy that that was doing it. Um, so basically, we look at it as like we were that lone nut. We were the first ones that went in there and we said, "Hey, you can sell riffs online." And we did it uh, over the last two and a half years. We did about, you know, four and a half million dollars um, over the last two, two, two and a half years, selling roofs directly to consumers online. And so we're trying to start a movement in, in this industry, and it, it, we, we are the lone nut. So you guys don't have to worry about being that lone nut, um, but like the guy in the video. But w what we say is the first companies to adopt destructive tech had the best chance to gain market share. So. Within your businesses, if you are the first adopters that do it, you're the ones that are, that are going to gain the biggest market share because a lot of your competitors are not doing now. So when a consumer goes online and they want to get a price, and they want to, that's the reason why they go online, and the only place that they can find it in your market or your area is on your website, the consumer is getting what they want, and I think that you're going to gain a lot more market share in, in your areas because you are the ones that have actually adopted the, the technology over anybody else. Anybody, everybody know these two companies? Everybody here know the story of these two companies? Yeah? The meeting. The meeting. The famous meeting. Uh, Blockbuster. Is there any more Blockbusters around? One. Yeah. It's amazing. Every time I, I, I talk about this, everybody knows that there's one. Where is it? Alaska? Alaska? <laughs> no. Bend, Oregon. You're right. It's Bend, Oregon. And I believe it's a VRBO, right? You can rent it out for a dollar a day. I think it's one of those things where you can go there and you can visit it. It's kind of like a historical landmark. There you go. Yep, there you go. So the story between Blockbuster and Netflix, right? So everyone knows how Blockbuster made all their money or majority of their money, right? That, that, yeah, yeah, be kind, please rewind, but also late fees. And that was a big piece of how they made their money was on late fees. And obviously, they saw that of what Netflix was going to do. And at a point in time, they had three choices that they could make. They could um, buy them out, right, and say, okay, I see what you're trying to do here. We're just going to go ahead and buy you out, and then we're not going to allow you to do whatever you want to do. They could do the same thing that they were doing. They could make a choice and say, hey, yeah, I can see that you're going this route. We'll just go ahead and copy you, and we'll, we'll, still, we'll uh, stay relevant. Or the last one was, they could do nothing. And they could just say, hey, we're going to continue on the same business model that we're going to do. We're not going to say, we're not going to go the online route or however, you know, Netflix was doing it. And we all know what choice they made, right? So uh, my last message to everybody here is don't let your company become the next blockbuster. <laughs>